I will present now um, Claudio Lopes, who is our first uh, keynote speaker, if you want. Uh, it is my pleasure to do it, Claudia. Claudia holds a graduation in psychology here in the University of Coimbra. Then she has also a master's degree in social psychology in the University of Porto. And she holds also a PhD in social research methods from LSE, London School of Economics. Uh, Claudia Lopes is nowadays a research fellow at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health. Prior, she was a lead consultant in Big Data and Gender at United Nations Women. Claudia has also worked on the charity sector with the Girl Effect as data scientist. And I, she works also on Africa Voice Foundation, leading projects that use digital data to accelerate and evaluate the impact of public health interventions. And she was also involved in evaluations for the World Bank and BBC Media Action. Her research interests focus on digital health, implementation science, and on methodologies that use new innovative data sources like big data, citizen generated data, as a complement to official statistics to monitor and advance sustainable development goals related to gender equality and health. I must say also that uh, prior to all of this, Claudia was my colleague as assistant at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Science. So it is my pleasure to welcome you here today, Claudia. Thank you for my team, and thank you as a great help for this very nice introduction to the project. So I'm also part of the project as a sponsor, but as I'm away, I, I do not have many opportunities to be with the team, so I'm really grateful that I was invited and I'm here for this discussion. Okay, so the presentation, what I'm going to, to present today, I thought about that enough, so we have social psychologists, we have sociologists, so I thought, what else can I present that is based on my work? So I thought that would be may maybe useful for the discussion if I present you some, not theories, not research, because I think we have enough of this in the project, but maybe I could add and bring a perspective um, of the United Nations. So because I work at the uh, International Institute of Global Health, is um, um, is part of the United Nations, so there's the United Nations University, so the think tank that uh, produces research and translates evidence from research into politics, in, sorry, into policy, and um, and I thought that maybe my contribution would be or giving you some frameworks and some studies that were developed by the UN agencies that are related with the right to adequate housing. Okay, so first of all, the human right to adequate housing was considered in the, and is considered in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there's the right for everyone to a standard of living that is adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care. So this is exactly the text that is there. But there are other uh, additions, variations, of these human rights to adequate housing, also by the international human rights tools. So there's the Yogi Karta principles that consider that this right to housing that should not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, or material or family status, that is of course more recent. And there's also the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that consider that uh, states, parties, uh, countries, governments should recognize the right of persons with disability to an adequate standard of living for themselves and their families, including adequate food, clothing, and housing. So this right to adequate housing is not only the right to the physical housing in terms of the walls and in terms of the roof, but if you look at the Yogi Akarta principles, is the right to affordable, habitable, accessible, culturally appropriate, and safe housing for everyone, irrespective of any uh, of any identification in any particular group, whether it's cultural, ethnic, um, class, um, education, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, <coughs> and so on. And there are also, in terms of the human rights com community, 
and other tools that um, also uh, try to assure that there's no discriminating, for example, in terms of the right of housing, of housing to women, there's a convention, convention of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women that also considers housing as a right. Um, so, for example, states have the obligation to ensure the same rights for both spouses in respect of the ownership, acquisition, management, administration, enjoyment and disposition of property. Um, and there's also the Istanbul Convention of Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women that also considers housing and, and uh, uh, in terms of, for example, shelters for survivors that need to exist in sufficient number to provide safe accommodation and to reach out proactively to victims. So, in terms of this framework, um, that's what I wanted to maybe um, present you. But I'm going to focus my presentation on the linkages between the adequate housing with gender equality and then with health and well-being. So how can you make the connection be between these three different aspects? So we saw already that gender appears in, the, as, uh, in terms of the right to housing, but there's also some health implications when people don't have this right fulfilled. Okay, so this right to housing contains freedoms and contains entitlements. So there's protection against forced evictions, there's the right to be free from arbitrary interference with one's home, privacy and family, and the right to choose one's residence to determine whether to live <coughs> and um, to freedom of movement. But there's also entitlements, that is the security of tenure, the housing, land and property institution, the equal and non-discriminatory access to adequate housing, and the participating housing related decision making at the national and community levels. In terms of the sustained development goals and, uh, and housing, we can think of a system thinking approach. So a system thinking is when we have these different system development goals or any other um, um, outcomes from different systems, for example, from the economy, with, we can link economy to public health, uh, to gender equality, everything that has some structural effects uh, and outcomes on, on people, we can link them together. I don't know if the system thinking is is, is uh, familiar to you, but it's just a way to look at uh, diagrams that can have causal, they can have loops, so there are reinforcing mechanisms. And uh, sometimes these, these causal loops are not always virtuous. They can give us unintended consequences. So the way that uh, the system, the, the systemic development goals are approached is through the systems thinking of this approach. So we, look, we need to look always, not in isolation, but how they are affected. So if you look at housing, and I, I look at uh, all the 17 SDGs, and there's one that is about housing, that is SDG 11, that is make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. But out of the 17, there are other eight that have uh, the direct or are determinants of good housing or have impacts when there's no good housing. For example, you know, if you think about climate change, we know that clim climate change is a determinant of housing and security. Or we can think that um, ensuring healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages is a consequence. The bad not having good health is a consequence of also housing insecurity and uh, poverty. Housing. So we can think of this system, in this system way, about these different SDGs. And I could add more, even education. For example, if you think about housing in the context of low and, in, in, and middle income countries, and think about, for example, people living in slums and living in informal settlements, not having the choice. Housing is an obstacle for girls to, um, to have education because it's related with their menstrual health, it's related, for example, with here, girls and boys with a distance to school, so housing is not only the house, it's also the neighborhood. So the not fulfilling this right will also have impacts in terms of, for example, the education. And we can go further and think about food insecurity, because if people need to 
pay the houses and the rent is very high, that will have impact on other conditions of their life and uh, the affordability of health, of food and so on. So this is all related and that's, I think, the message that I wanted to also convey here. So in terms of the housing crisis, the international context, and, and I look at uh, different uh, reports from UN, and there's an agency that works on the right to housing that is UN Habitat. And, and nowadays, and this is I think from 2020, there's a, over a billion people around the world that currently live in precarious conditions that threaten their health and survival, such as slums and informal settlements. And many living in these conditions are homeless and millions are forcibly evicted or displaced from their homes every year. And women are particularly affected by this situation. So women are the higher proportion in terms of evictions. And even homelessness, I think the statistics say that, that men, they are more at risk, risk of being homeless. But the homelessness is higher in women. It's just women don't sleep rough because of security, because of they are, they are with children. So when in a situation when a woman is homeless, it's, uh, it's um, easier for uh, NGOs, for housing councils to find accommodation for women more than a man. And so that's why we own, homeless people are mainly men, but the homelessness risk is greater in women. And there's also a study of, uh, this, this is a study that was done in 2019 on 200 cities globally, and uh, this was uh, cited in the World Economic Forum, that considered that 90% of the cities in 2019 were found to be unaffordable to live in, with average home costing more than three times the average income. And by 2030, in terms of projections, of the sustainable development goals, you know that the deadline for achieving these goals in 2030. But UN Habitat estimates that 3 billion people, about 30% of the world's population, will need access to adequate housing. And an estimated 100 million people worldwide are homeless, and one in four people will live in harmful conditions to their health, safety, and prosperity. There are several reasons for that, and they vary depending on if you think global north, global south, for example, we know the housing crisis in Portugal is determined by different factors that, for example, I, I live in Malaysia, then the housing crisis in Malaysia. So, housing crisis in Malaysia is related with effects of the climate change. We see floods every year with people losing their homes and people being uh, homeless because of the impact of climate change. We don't see that in Portugal as much, but we see in immobiliary speculation, we see the influx of tourism. There are other countries that you can think the housing crisis is related with, for example, migration movements. So there are several reasons that may apply to different contexts, but they are also, we, we can think that they are worsening the situation. So this housing crisis is a global housing crisis. And that's the, the message from UN Habitat. It's just, we are, rather than accelerating, advancing towards the Sustainable Development Goal 11, we are receding. Okay, so I would like no, now to make the connections with health. So housing and the neighborhood in which people live are, have important implications for individual health, for the employment and educational outcomes. So when we think about housing as being determinant of health, what comes to mind is that WHO, they have a framework that consider what are the social determinants of health. And this is the framework, it's relatively recent, um, and um, housing is one of the, in terms of the social policies, is one of the determinants, but then we can see that from the structural side of the determinants, we have other uh, characteristics that is related with gender intersectionality, that you know, gender interacting with other axes of inequality, such as social class and ethnicity. So, and we, we saw already that there are some differences in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the, the right, I mean, the, how the right to housing is fulfilled for different people. So, this will also impact 
the, the equity and, and health and, and well-being. So, Okay, so in terms of housing being a determinant of health and well-being, we can think of well-being. Well-being is not only the absence of illness. Well-being is psychological well-being, and as, as, as well as the physical well-being. Um, so when we, when we look at uh, what is the impact of poor housing, uh, or housing, let's call it housing insecurity, um, in terms of health, um, we can, if you think about the physical, the results are very well established. So, the physical aspects of the housing, such as the toxins in the home, mold and indoor in temperatures, and overcrowding and safety factors, they have physical and psychological effects. And um, but there are also the psychological aspects of it. And I think this project is is about the psychology approach. To, to housing, and we can think that uh, the, the psychological and the cultural values of the housing, it, it goes beyond housing as material object, and, um, and is, is related to understanding housing as a site of control, of autonomy, of so socialization, and also basis of social identity and status. So this will have a direct impact on the psychological well-being of the individuals, and their perce perception of health and well-being. Um, so th there are some studies that also that look at these questions of the status and empowerment and the aspects of the control related to the ownership of the housing. And uh, they all converge in, in the finding that this is very important for the perception of the well-being of the individuals. Um, so we, we only looking at the social determinants of health we can see that just the social economic position will have an impact on the health of individuals. So if you couple this to low income households that are more at risk of poor health and well-being and they also experience uh, poor housing, so they are the most vulnerable uh, that will, in terms of the well-being that is related to housing as one of the factors that contribute to the uh, worsening of their the health. Um, And of course, that if you think of uh, housing insecurity, this also comes with, uh, um, with difficulty in terms of the financial situation. And this will also bring the worries, they will put them more at risk of depression or of mental health. So this is not only one factor, this is an agglomeration of the different factors that constitutes, I think, the inequalities that will uh, lead to the worse outcomes. But there's a study from 2020 that looks at mechanisms whereby these factors will impact health. And this is a relatively <coughs> new study because uh, before, most of the studies that we found in the literature, and maybe Raquel, you, you may talk a little bit more about that, but when we look at well-being and health and well-being, they were focused on the physical characteristics. But even that, um, when, when there was this psychological well-being, the mechanisms, they were not explicit. So this study uh, tries to disentangle what is the context, the mechanism and the outcome. So this is part of a realist uh, evaluation uh, that looks at uh, C and O. So in terms of the, the mechanisms, they consider that housing becomes a home, reducing the stress for tenants. So when people feel that they, have, they are at home, and um, if, the home, if the house is comfortable, well presented, and enables relaxation and sense of status that will also increase their psychological well-being. And um, it's also important to look at the neighborhood, the environment and networks that can reduce the stress and increase the opportunities for socialization that is also positively correlated with their well-being. And, uh, and also the affordable housing reduces financial stress. So these are the mechanisms. So what are the contexts? where these mechanisms will operate. So we need to take into account, for example, the housing needs of the tenants, the previous experience with housing, what they consider to be a good house, a comfortable, it depends on 
what are the expectations, what are the lived experiences, how they um, perceive others in the neighborhood to live, and, and of course there are then characteristics that are more objective related to the property quality, and then uh, there are the characteristics of the environment. So of the neighborhood, the quality, the available of social support networks, and then there are the financial aspects in terms of the rent levels, the income levels, the availability of benefits related to, uh, to housing and, and the landlord response to financial difficulties if they are evicted, if the landlord, if the relationship with landlord is also a very good predictor of uh, people feeling secure at home. So if they have a good relationship with them, they, they maybe think that if there's any problem and they are um, behind in terms of their rent payments, the landlord will understand the situation and, uh, and there are some moratory period. So yeah, so this is the, the framework in terms of how housing, security or insecurity impact health outcomes. Um, in terms of specific health outcomes, and now I would like to make the transition to gender, there, has been, there have, haven't been many studies that look at disaggregation of these outcomes per different groups. So they consider there's like a general outcomes that apply to everyone, but it's not the case. So in terms of the general outcomes, you can think in terms of mental health, depression, psychological impairment, happiness, um, suicide, psychological distress, and physical or general health. The outcomes that have been cited in the literature has to do with the impact of non-communicable diseases, you know, such as the cancer risk, um, cardiovascular diseases, uh, respiratory symptoms. There are also some studies that relate to women that uh, uh, associate poor housing with the increasing risk of miscarriage, um, and uh, you know, can think of asthma. Um, and, and mortality also in general. Um, but there's also uh, uh, behaviors that are related to health. It's not the direct aspect of health, but poor housing also um, contributes for increasing uh, the smoking, alcohol misuse, HIV risk behavior, and lowering the physical exercise. And finally, there's also other measures related that will have implications of health that has to be the criminal behaviors and uh, domestic violence and, and so on. So when we think about the health outcomes, there's the physical, the psychological, the behavior related, and, and there's also other measures of health. So when we now think of it in terms of the gender perspective, taking a gender perspective to this relationship between the housing and health. So, and here we are doing already the system thinking how, how these different components interact. There are not many stu studies. And, um, but the Human Rights Council in 2020 has urged states to ensure women's equal right to adequate housing as a component of the right to an adequate standard of living in all aspects of housing strategies, including through equal access to credit mortgages home ownership and rental housing to take the safety of such housing properly into account, especially when women and children face any form of violence or threat of violence, and to understand legislative and other forms to realize equal rights for all with respect to property and inheritance. Um, so this may not apply also to all contexts. So in Portugal, there is no explicit discrimination, gender discrimination, in for, in, for example, in terms of property <coughs> and inheritance related to land, but there are many countries where women cannot inherit land and property. Um, so I think now, if we stop a little bit to think, how can we incorporate gender in this perspective? Gender it doesn't mean that there's an explicit discrimination against women. And when we think about gender, I'm taking the, no, a non-binary perspective of thinking of gender identity of man, woman, and then or transsex, transsexual individuals and non-binary. I, I will call it gender diverse. I know that it may not be consensual, but I will say man, woman, and gender diverse individuals. Because there are vulnerabilities that are related to each one of these groups that identify with, the, with different genders. And that's where, what we mean when we say we'll take a gender perspective. It's not only look at the perspective of women, is how these power relations in society, the way that the rules and um, the social norms, the access to resources, 
are different for people with different gender identities. So when, what are the expectations and how this will impact the right to housing and then as a consequence they house housing. Okay, so um, it, it, this is also, um, we know that women are disadvantaged compared to men in housing uh, because women have lower incomes and lower savings. So um, even when they are trying to, for example, get a mortgage, there's no di discrimination, like to say, if a mortgage will have a different outcome for men or for women, but just for the fact that women have less financial capacity, that means that if you are doing, it, doing the same, we are already discriminating against women. So there's a perspective that um, I think I, I'm going to unpack a little bit in a minute. Um, but we also need to, th to think about groups of, uh, not women and men are not homogeneous groups, so if you think about women as single parent families and households that are only single women, we can, we can see that they are even more at risk because they have even less financial power and they have less savings, but also they have the demands of uh, uh, childcare and uh, couple with, uh, with work that maybe implies that to get to a certain level of uh, income, they need maybe to work for two or three jobs. So all this is also related with the job security and the, the participation of women in the, in the labor force. And, and even if you think about that even women with a partner, so they will benefit from the privilege, let's call it, of, of a husband or of a spouse, but women are also more vulnerable to homelessness after a relationship breaks down because maybe rent contract is the, the name of the man that is in the rent contract or if, they're, they're, if they buy it together maybe because the man may have more savings they will give the, the initial uh, amount for a mortgage so, and that will entitle the woman, the man, to, put the, the, to, to have the asset in his name and we are talking partnerships that may very formal or not. So when there are the divorce or the breakup, a woman is at higher risk of homelessness. Um, so if, if you think of gender as this, um, this social structure that is part of these determinants of health and of housing, um, we, we can think that if we do not address these power relations in terms of gender, these dynamics are going to be repeated, are going to be exacerbated when we are thinking about the dynamics of housing, who has access to the secure housing and the right to housing. And there's a framework to think about that if this is not completely clear, that if, if we are thinking about um, how can we incorporate gender in policies related, for example, to housing, we, we can think that of a spectrum of how responsive these policies can be to gender. And this spectrum can be from gender inequal, that is, for example, the, the example that women are discriminated in terms of inheritance law related to land and property, so they discriminate against women, but even when they do not discriminate, if they are just blind, if they, they, if they don't consider these gender power relations in society, they are already discriminate because they don't address them. So they are going to be repeated, they are going to be applied. And so there's, on the, this part of the, of the scale, that this is the gender responsiveness as the, the assessment scale, we can think of politics or intervention to be gender sensitive. Gender sensitive is just acknowledge the disadvantage and vulnerability of women of, of, of certain groups in terms of their right to housing. But acknowledging it doesn't change. But at least there's already a awareness that there's some inequality. So if you want to be gender responsive, or we can be gender specific, gender specific is have some policies that are targeted particularly as women. For example, if you think about the 
domestic violence, gender-based violence, we know that most of the survivors are women. So if you think of shelters for women, is addressing the problem that is gender-specific. It's resolving a particular, uh, giving a particular sol solution for something that, uh, an issue that is already gendered. But ideally, we will have policies that will be gender transformative, that will address the root causes of the gender inequalities. And this is very difficult to do. So this will have impact in other sectors of society, of course, but it will be increasing the secu financial security of women, um, increasing uh, the, um, the access, for example, in, to, to the job market, to have um, more, uh, to have more um, um, support in terms of social services for, for example, for children, for the elderly, that will help women with their care, role, um, the role of caregivers, for example. So, it doesn't, the gender responsiveness, it doesn't need to be ex related to housing, but has to do about addressing these inequalities that already exist in societies. Okay. So let me just, um, before I show you that framework, and are you okay in terms of time? Five minutes, right? Okay, it's, I, I, I'm finishing. Um, so, um, in terms of the studies, when they look at the differences between men and women and gender diverse individuals, they see that um, one of the common um, findings is that women and uh, non-binary or trans individuals, they have, um, worse mental health outcomes related with poor housing. So poor <coughs> housing affects, impacts women and gender diverse individuals more than impacts men. So, and in terms of the exactly the, the, the symptoms and uh, diagnostic related with the mental health, there's also some differences. You know, for example, for women it's more depression, more sleep disorders, increased risk of suicidal thoughts, and um, whether, for example, for non-binary of transgender people, because they are more affected by stigma, discrimination, uh, there's also, there are also a higher risk of physical and sexual violence, increased substance abuse, and uh, lower adherence to treatment, probably because of discrimination also in the health system, um, and lack of social support, uh, and they, they also have a higher probability of being harassed in the neighborhood context. So the mental health outcomes are worse for these groups of people. Um, but when we think about being a gender perspective, it's not only about comparing differences of the outcomes. We need to explain them. It's how we can use the knowledge and awareness that we have about gender relations in society to understand why these different uh, outcomes exist. Um, and, uh, and these are related with, for example, with the household roles for men and for women and, uh, and their housework. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the physical and even the mental health of women um, is reported to be worse when they live with their parents, even if they, they live with their partner and children. Because of their role as caregiving, giving, they, are, they have a higher, uh, higher sorry, um, workload for, for home chores compared to men. Whether in men, when they live with their parents, they, they report a higher well-being than women. Because they probably they have other people who do the, the the caregiving role for them, right? So this is these are not generalizations. These are like related with cultural norms and practices that are different in different groups, classes, societies. But I'm just giving some examples, some contextual examples. So if you want to look at a, so this is a study by by Vasquez Vera, Fernandez and Borrell from 2022 that they look at the framework of to understand the, this is, is, called, is a social ecological model to understand the, the impacts of um, housing on health, bringing a gender perspective. So in the um, society level, they consider there are oppression systems that are related with patriarchy, patriarchy with colonialism and capitalism that will have impact on policies related with welfare and, and economic policies and also will have impact in terms of cultural and values and this will impact the housing system, the housing market and the housing policies. And this will then have an impact on the access to adequate housing and then the li living experiences of people in terms of the physical environment in the house, 
the way they perceive it, the house, and also the way that they perceive and live in the neighborhood. And this will, will lead to an equal impact on health. Okay, and just to finalize, um, so what, what can be done? And, um, uh, and there are some guidelines for the implementation of the right to adequate housing that bring a gender perspective. So how can we mainstream gender into these policies? And this was developed recently, two years ago, by the Special Rapporteur on the right of adequate housing, and the recommendations are to recognize the independent right of women to security of tenure irrespective of their family of relationship status, to guarantee equal access to credit, mortgages, home ownership, and rental housing, including through subsidies, to ensuring situation of household violence, immediate access to emergency shelters, and through legislation that regardless of whether a woman has title, formal ownership, or tenancy rights, she's able to remain in her own home where appropriate and have the perpetrator perpetrator removed and guarantee the right of women to participate in all aspects of housing related policy making including housing design and construction, community development planning and transportation and infrastructure. And we can think of this is bringing the gender perspective into the policies but we can also think what are the basic policies that what needs to be done and in many countries is already done. Um, and I think if you want to think um, what, what are, for example, the UK has going through a, um, an enormous housing crisis and has put into place several measures, policies are ready to address it. So some of them include you know, investment in social housing, the private sector regulation and rent controls, that is something that we are seeing already now happening in Portugal related with the tourism uh, habitation. Um, and measures to protect tenants from eviction, social security to provide adequate safety net for vulnerable groups, and properly resource emergency and permanent accommodation for domestic abuse survivors. These are like the, the policies that need to be in place, but in itself they are not enough. They, are, they do not uh, mainstream gender. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what I wanted to present you, so I'm looking forward for your questions and for the discussion. And, my email is there if you'd like to ask for any of this um, literature. Um, thank you, Claudia.